so before we get started, I was wondering if you can share with our viewers and our listeners a little bit about Paul Brunton. Who is Paul Brunton? Yes. I mean, did you ever hear of Paul Brunton before the inner tradition sent you this book? I I have to tell you, I did not. I'm well, going to be fun. honest. Well, <laughs> I, I would have been surprised if you'd said, oh, yes, I've read all his books. But actually, the the, the wife of the publisher is an Indian woman. Her name is uh, Vitala, I believe, if I remember correctly. And she told me that when she was a, a young girl, her brother read her Paul Brunton's books, like before bed kind of thing. And she was very familiar with, there was, he wrote around 10 books or 11 books or something in the 1930s and 40s mostly of you know last century and um, that was part of the reason she was eager that inner tradition should do this instructions for spiritual living wow. because it it you know touched back into something that had, she had valued so much as a child um, you know, Paul Brunton was quite popular in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. He was kind of like your, you know, when you watch the news on PBS or something mm -hmm. and they're talking about some subject like science, like mm -hmm. global warming or something, and they bring in like Bill Nye, the science guy. You know, yeah. well, Paul Brunton was like the go to person on Eastern yeah. spirituality uh, at that time. And he, he traveled all over the world. Um, in the well in his late 20s i think 30s 40s he traveled really until he kind of settled in switzerland and i think in the 1960s but he he had many like sea trunks those old big boxes you know like you see in the old <laughs> movies he had a, a like a big room in a warehouse someplace full of them from all his things that he had collected when he traveled and books and just many gifts and things that people had given him and um so what I want to say is that, yes, he, he got around, he met a lot of teachers and um, other kinds of leaders, like he was good friends with the Maharaja of Mysore, for one, and the royalty of Spain and Greece also. Wow. Some of those Was people he? are still alive, you know. And, yes, <laughs> and but why did he travel it wasn't like he was a trust fund baby with a lot of money and he just didn't want to settle down he from a very early age was um, very interested in spirituality and he had some of his most profound spiritual experiences before he ever left britain before he ever left london where he grew up i think it the some deep experiences came upon him when he was in his late teens and uh, he lived in the cultural center of london and there was he had friends one of his friends founded a bookshop called the atlantis bookshop mm -hmm. and that bookstore still exists today in london a hundred wow. years later so he, he and there was a lot of theosophy in london at that time and People interested in the early 1900s, especially like the spiritualists, which meant interested in life after death and communicating with people who have died and those kinds of um, those kinds of studies and pursuits were rather popular. Also, um, besides theosophy and that uh, Christian science had become quite popular, which, you know, has a lot to do with mind, they consider mind as um, the powerful basis of things and that illness is a sign that you don't have your mind right. Okay. And he be yeah. followed some of that, but in the end he rejected it as not as being too partial. But so these were some of his early influences. Early influences. But some one of someone he met who he regarded highly suggested that he go to India, which he did, and he did this book, for one of his very first books, was A Search in Secret Search India. In, yeah. And some people know that book. I yes. actually, yeah, I actually, a couple of days ago, um, I, I had a friend. So I was talking to her, hey, I'm going to do this interview. And do you know Paul Brenton? I just asked. 
And she said, yeah, I do. I said, you do? <laughs> and so she's reading that book right now and she has, you know, uh, read some of his work. So I was like, all of a sudden, I'm meeting these people who know. Yes. And um, I'm also, uh, one of my friends is mentoring me and I think I shared with you and he has read many of Paul Brunton's books because then I shared with him. So yes, I think that book, um, I it's on my read list. I haven't yes. read it yet. <laughs> it's, an, it's like adventure, you know, it's spiritual adventure travel basically. Yeah. But, so. you know, he explored the yogi, yogis and um, various systems of teachings in India. And, um, but the most profound meetings he had were with two people. One was Sri Shankaracharya of Kanchipuram, you know, the, he's in the south of India, yeah. and um, he very much considered a sage. Um, he passed away some years ago, but he lived longer than Paul Brunton. And the other person that was, well, um, Shankaracharya said, you really should go see Ramana, Ramana Maharshi, Right. So yeah. Ramana Maharshi really was probably the most one of the most revered people in Paul Brunton's life. Um, he remained connected to Ramana until his end of his life, you know, inwardly connected. They had some kind of inner mystical sort of correspondence at times. Yeah. Um, but so that book, Search and Secret India, brought Ramana Maharshi to the attention of the world and, and consequently also the ashram in uh, Tiruvannamali started growing. You know, many Westerners started coming and, and living there for quite a long time who then wrote their own books like Arthur, right. Arthur Osborne and others about Ramana. Well, what can I tell you? So you were talking about, you know, Sri Ramana Maharishi, you know, and, and their special mystic bond. And because it's been said that he really, you know, had his awakening in his, in his presence. In know? his presence? Yeah, like, you know, with, with the time that he has spent with him in India. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, like, what influence, how much influence his writings and teachings are from him compared to the other teachers because yes. you know he's he followed other teachers as well Eastern oh teachers. yes so, because he also studied buddhism and yeah. some tibetan buddhism he studied the buddhism of southeast asia um he had a connection with a mongolian who met him at angkor wat and gave him some special teachings about what this, this doctrine P.B. writes about called mentalism, which is mm -hmm. that mind or intelligence right. is the primary force um, in, you know, it's a way of describing reality. Uh, Ramana brought, well, Ramana had a, an influence on Paul Brunton, but like I said, the, pro the thing that confuses people was actually something that P.B. created. I would call him P.B. because that's what he liked to be called, Paul yeah. Brunton. P.B. wrote that book, A Search in Secret India, as if he was a skeptical Westerner doing some journalistic research about the mysteries of India. Okay. You, you see, I mean, you know, Britain had taken over India, colonized India, mm -hmm. and it was that had been um, solidified by the mid-1800s, the British rule in India. And um, I mean, I think only one of the gifts that maybe the British gave to India was the English language, which unified all the different parts of India. But I think India has given so much more in a way to the West by this, you know, being the cradle of spirituality to the world. But as I mentioned earlier, PB had already had deep mystical experiences before which that. he which to hit which he did not understand you know it's one thing to have some inner opening and realize oneself as a formless presence or something mm -hmm. like that but it's another thing to actually know what happened you know what was that and i think you know some of his past life karma just spontaneously was reasserting itself and mm -hmm. putting him back on his own 
development to enlightenment. Um, so the experience that he had with Ramana is in the book, and it's a profound experience. But I'd like to actually read you something that Ramana said about PB. He says, several times visitors asked Maharshi how Paul Brunton came to have the illumination described in A Search and Secret India and why they couldn't get it, even though after sitting with Ramana for many years, you know, they still didn't have anything like what PB described in the book. Maharshi said that PB practiced sadhana, you know, spiritual practice in former births to a very highly advanced state and was consequently ripe for fuller illumination in this life. Oh. So it basically said, you know, PB didn't come to India as a neophyte, as right. a beginner, but he, he wrote for Westerners. He was writing this book for Westerners to introduce them to the spirituality of the East. And he was concerned that if he postured himself like an expert in, in, in it, like he was already had bought their story and was a full believer, you know, like that, that it would give him less credibility than if he took more of a, you know, scientific journalistic posture, you know, approach. So people, that in a way has continued to haunt him because many people, not like your friend who's read a number of PB books, mm -hmm. many people say, oh, right, he was that journalist who introduced PB, I mean, introduced Ramana to the West. So they give him credit for, you know, bringing something from bringing that something. <laughs> he was a good, you know, a good reporter, you know, <laughs> like that. But it, it really wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So um, what, where, where do I want to go from there? So that was his first book. And then he wrote a book called The Secret Path. That book really did reflect a lot of the teachings that Ramana had to give. Mm -hmm. about self-inquiry and so on, and meditation, developing intuition. And that's a very nice little book. It's still in print, you know, 80 years later. Many, uh, eight of PB's original books are still in print 80 years later with major publishers, you know, Penguin Random House in the UK and the US. But in line with this, Ramana said to PB, he says, you're saying the same things in your books that I say, only you do it in a modern way. Right. And this is, this is really the key to, under, mm -hmm. you know, to understanding what PB was offering English, basically English readers, although his books are translated in, Ma in yeah, including like, is it Gujarati? Gujarati. Yeah, <laughs> and Marathi or something. There's another one. I'm, maybe I'm not saying it right. I have a you know a list of over 20 <laughs> languages, and a number of them are in Telugu, Hindi, Tamil, and some of these less well-known languages of India. Mm -hmm. So, but he was writing primarily for the West at the time he was mm -hmm. doing it, and um, how to bring you know, the, the, in, the sutras of the Indian, you know, spirituality, the Vedanta especially, Advaita Vedanta, mm -hmm. the Upanishads and so on, how to bring these teachings structured as they were in, in the original, you know, uh, writings with commentaries, how to, how to reframe these for Westerners. They had to be written in a whole different style. Plus, you know, Paul Brunton, because he was so developed um, mystically and rationally, he was able to develop and um, unfold in a way these doctrines in a, in, in a more accessible way to modern mentality, which is what Ramana, Ramana was saying about PB, as you do this for the modern reader. So... For instance, the Manduki Upanishad is a famous Hindu text, Vedantic text, and it has very few sentences in it, but then there's a lot of commentary. Right. But basically, it talks about the waking dream and deep sleep states, and the fourth state, which is called Turiya, which is, you call it the divine ground or fundamental reality that we are. So PB's book, The Wisdom of the Overself, Basically, a lot of it follows an outline of, of 
about discussing these states of consciousness and how, to, but he goes into some detail also in how to work with them meditatively and, you know, he, he presents a lot of material that not only did he get from sources in India, but I think other sources too. So, so yeah. that was one of his last books, right? The Wisdom of the Oversell. Yeah, in that original collection that he did in the 30s and 40s. But he never stopped writing. I guess this is like I could just sort of finish this a little bit. He never stopped writing. Mm -hmm. And after he died, the, um, the foundation, the Paul Brunton Philosophic Foundation had not yet formed. His son, Kenneth Hurst, inherited the writing of PB. And he came to Ithaca, New York, where we live. We were already familiar with Kenneth. He was friends with the person that I've studied with here in Ithaca for a number of years. And um, he saw that we had a group of people that loved PB that were eager to do the work. And so we received about 75,000 pages of Paul Brunton's writings and also photographs, thousands of photographs, uh, diaries of uh, different people that he was close Newspaper to. Newspaper cuttings. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of what we call the clips, yes. Uh, and I have looked through a volume of book reviews that's mm -hmm. many, many pages long where mm -hmm. his publisher must have, as publishers used to do, go through all the newspapers looking for anything referring to the books he was doing and they sent him these, these you know, reviews and many of those now are on our website, paulbrunton.org is our website. And you can read about his life there and the books that have been published. And um, from these many, many pages of unpublished writings, our group or organized a publication of 16 volumes of about 7,000 of those pages that, you know, we went through a, a much of the material and picked what we thought was juicy, and it's in 28 categories that PB himself created that cover many, many aspects of the spiritual path, including things like physical health, you know, med various basic meditations, advanced meditations, working with negativity, the nature of the ego, um, the nature of what he calls the over-self or higher self, um, and nature of God, which he calls the world mind and mind in itself, using these terms from mentalism that I mentioned <laughs> earlier. Sorry, you have an allergy. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'll pause here. I just, and oh, in this book, Instructions for Spiritual Living, <laughs> I get to flash the cover, right? Um, <laughs> it's a nice cover. <laughs> it, it's not my book, right? I didn't write it. I was the editor, but and I was privileged to be the editor. But this book, came from the unpublished, previously unpublished writings of Paul Brunton. They were not published during his lifetime, but there are key essays that I organized to be a manual for spiritual practice. Mm 